Thanks, Krista. Thanks, KEI, for um, organising this event and for inviting us to say a few words. Um, I won't take much of your time. I think many people have heard what our um, hot issues are, and you know, to be quite honest, they are unchanged. Uh, if we are going to have um, a, a simple, usable, meaningful treaty, we need some really important things in the treaty. One is the distribution to individuals. Most of the people who are blind in the world live in the developing world. Many countries in the developing world do not have established necessarily sustainable ent or for entities that can distribute. So we need to be mindful of that. We know the technology exists to allow distribution and we know distribution to individuals work works. Bookshare being a perfect example of that. Another key issue for us, or a hot issue for us, is commercial availability. We, we do not want reference to commercial availability in Articles D and E. And for reasons that, you know, how would anyone in Zambia know, or how would anyone in UK, if they're asked by someone in Zambia, if something's, you know, commercially available in another country, people don't know, they can't be expected to find out. These are very poor people and often very uh, lowly resourced organisations and, you know, it is just bureaucratic and what do we even mean by commercial availability? I think we've all heard this week and seen examples of and Marcus gave a great example in his opening remarks. Just because something might be available, it doesn't mean it's usable by a person who's blind. And I think that's a really important distinction to make. And another issue for us is, of course, that TPMs cannot block the accessibility of books. We do not want to have people fear of being sued or whatever if they unblock a book. And we don't want a book to be able to get to a person in another country and then not be able to be read. Now, I know there's been some progress on some of these things, um, but our position is we will look at the entire text, which I understand is going to come out tomorrow or in late another version, and we want to see how our issue and the biggest overriding issue, does the treaty meet the needs of people who are blind? That is, getting access to the books they cannot now currently get access to. That is our number one one step that we want in the treaty. Um, I think there's also, and I just want to make one more comment because I won't take too much time, and that is the issue of translation has come up, and as I understand, I'm willing to be corrected if I'm wrong, that it's become a hot issue for some. It hasn't been an issue that we ever brought to the table, but so long as it was able to be resolved and sorted and didn't interfere with the rest of the treaty, we had no problem with it. But one thing I would say is I would not want that to be used as a bargaining tool against some of the other key principles that we say, if they are not there, we will not have a treaty that works. So end, I'll end now and just say we want a simple, usable, meaningful treaty that all people who are blind in the world, irrespective of where they live and, and what they do, they can have access to books that everyone else takes for granted. Thank you. Um, since Mary Ann does have to leave uh, a bit early, she has another meeting at 2.30, I would like to ask if there's any questions from the audience for Mary Ann. Okay, well I, I was just wondering, Mary Ann, if you could expand a little bit on the point that you made regarding uh, commercial availability and um, of just because something being available doesn't mean that it's usable. Okay. And I know Marcus is an expert on this one too. If there is a book that um, is in a digital form, deemed to be commercial available, but is in so it, it might or audio is a good example. Audio file that you, an audio book you can buy from a store. So you might put it in your machine and you turn it on and you read from beginning to end. You can't navigate the book. You can't manipulate the text. You can't do anything. If you're a student studying, often you are asked to go to a page number, a chapter number, and so on. That is not an accessible book in, for that person. It's a really important point. So it's got to be accessible for the person and their needs. Um, that's an important thing. And, and with the whole issue of commercial availability, most countries in the world, and we know I think only seven have it in their domestic law, so really, it, to me, it's just a bit of a nonsense. But you know, why put on a whole lot of requirements, bureaucratic 
rules and regulations on something that is not an issue for most people in the world and um, potentially limits the available the availability of shipping books to people in other countries. Thank you, Mary. After through it. I don't know if it's uh, do, do we have any questions from our panelists for Marianne? Could I, yeah. may I just say one thing very quickly? Yes. Um, very, very quickly on commercial availability. Um, Dan, Dan Pesok from World Blind Union also. Commercial availability is perhaps, well, allegedly perhaps the biggest sticking point still, so it's important to just think about it for a second. Whichever way we argue this, and I know Carla will have a different view about what's in the text, and that's entirely fair enough that you're broke to. One thing I want to underline now, and I'll say it to you now, and I'll say it to you in five, ten years' time, if we have a good treaty or a bad treaty or no treaty, when, and I think it is a when eventually, publishers make their books accessible meaningfully at the sensible price and really accessible mainstream for blind people, whether or not it says in a treaty you have to do commercial availability checks, or it says nothing about it, or we have no treaty, or whatever, blind people will go and buy those books or get them from libraries as a default, irrespective of the treaty, that's what they will do. So you will beg to differ probably, and that's entirely fair enough, but I promise you that that's what will happen because that's the way the world works. Um, if, you know, I, I know I'm speaking for blind people and other blind people here can say it, but I just want to make sure this point is heard. Um, when it's successful in the mainstream, that's what people want to do. People don't want to get, you know, I wouldn't want to go and get a, quote, special something or other when I can get a mainstream something or other more easily that everyone else has got to that works fine. So publishers should at least take some reassurance or at least should really think carefully about the reassurance I'm giving. That we will not undermine the market because we want that market to happen. And no blind person's organization will use what is, after all, a not-for-profit treaty to try and undermine a market for stuff that we would just like to do because we've got a million other things to get on with doing. So I just think that's an important point to make. Sorry to take up the time. No, I just want to uh, uh, say, as a blind person, I think, thank you, Dan, for raising that, and I should have um, added it. But I can tell you, I would like to walk into the local bookstore in my community and buy a book. And I can't do that now. Why would I wait six months, three months, whatever it takes for my organisation to put that book in accessible format and wait and search the world and see if it's available? Just like everyone else in the world, when I want a book, I want it now. And I would be, I would be quite happy to get it now, pay for it, and you know what? That would be the best world we'd ever live in. But, you know, that's a long way off. Thank mm -hmm. you.